could uh, have a seat so we can get started, please. Okay. okay, hello everybody. It's, uh, uh, welcome to the GEOS Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, as you know, this is, a, this is a series of lectures that uh, GEOS is organizing uh, with the objective of uh, bringing internationally recognized uh, researchers uh, to tell about uh, their work. So today we are very uh, honored to have with us uh, Dr. Dimitrios Jovaras, who is um, the chairman of the board of directors at the Center of Research and Technology in Hellas, uh, let's call it CERT. Uh, from, and he has, um, he, you know, this is, uh, one of the most uh, prestigious research organizations in Greece. Um, Dr. Jovaras has conducted um, uh, his, uh, he has published uh, three books, uh, 55 book chapters, 250 publications in journals, in referee journals, and, and more than 600 uh, uh, presentations in international conferences. Uh, his main uh, research interests are in the area of uh, network and visual analytics, uh, computer vision, robotics, uh, virtual and augmented reality, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Uh, since uh, 1992, he has participated with his team in more than 300 research and development projects funded by the EU and also by the Greek uh, General Secretariat for Research and Innovation. Uh, in addition, they, they, he, has, uh, uh, he has been very successful with industrial uh, um, projects. And uh, this is with leading companies like uh, Samsung and, and Pfizer. Uh, Dr. Um, Jovaras is also actively involved in innovation and entrepreneurship initiatives. He's the co-founder of nine uh, spin-offs of uh, CERT and the initiator of one of the most innovative activities in the area of e-infrastructures of Greece, uh, the Near Zero Energy uh, Smart House, uh, which is an officially, uh, which is officially recognized uh, as a digital innovation hub in the EU. Um, and uh, he's also the coordinator of a mega project on artificial intelligence and simulation applications, uh, which is the fourth generation technological park of the Saloniki, which is the most important innovation project, project in, in Northern Greece. Um, I should also mention that uh, uh, GEOS has a, a long-term collaborations uh, with CERT, and uh, we participate in many joint projects, and we hope that this collaboration can actually be uh, expanded uh, through more targeted uh, uh, collaboration um, uh, opportunities uh, uh, with, this, uh, with, with this visit. So, um, so we are very honored to have uh, Dr. Jovaras with us and uh, his, uh, his talk today is entitled Deep Learning as a Key Enabling Technology for Industry 4.0. Thank you, uh, Professor Policarpo, and uh, also thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, all uh, uh, professors and collaborators involved in Nikios for the time we spent the last uh, two days uh, uh, trying to, to find uh, ways to enhance uh, this collaboration between CERT and uh, Kios. Uh, today, uh, when I was invited by Professor Policarpo, uh, I thought uh, since uh, uh, we have uh, many activities uh, at CERT that uh, are producing interesting uh, 
uh, scientific results, uh, but also applied uh, results I uh, wanted to present. And uh, I decided uh, to focus on uh, three main industrial projects that uh, have been assigned to, to CERT and uh, how we have used uh, deep learning uh, to, to give uh, to provide solution uh, to problems that uh, uh, Greek and uh, European uh, industries uh, uh, have uh, in, uh, in three specific use cases that I will present uh, shortly. Uh, just a few words, this is uh, CERT, uh, you can see uh, we are in uh, the area of Thermi in Thessaloniki, but we have also uh, subsidiaries in six regions and uh, eight cities in uh, Greece. Uh, we have uh, more than 1,400 uh, employees and uh, an annual turnover uh, around 50 uh, mega euro. Uh, and uh, what is important is that a uh, large number of this comes from uh, research projects, but uh, uh, only 10% from the government and 13% comes from industrial uh, projects. And uh, uh, together with Kios, we are very successful in uh, European uh, projects and uh, we are actually number 12 uh, in Europe and uh, number one in this uh, last uh, 10 years. Uh, just a few words about CERT. CERT uh, is an umbrella organization uh, uh, comprised by five institutes. What I will be presenting today is mainly activities of the information and communication, uh, sorry, Information Technology Institute, with, which focuses on research on information and communication technologies. Uh, areas uh, that uh, IPI uh, is working on are uh, AI, machine learning, uh, decision making, but also robotics and uh, virtual augmented reality and social network analytics and uh, a lot of work on uh, fighting discrimination, but also on IoT, smart cities, uh, where we have many common uh, themes with uh, Kios and energy and sensor networks and uh, a large group on cybersecurity and blockchain, but also a smaller group on uh, remote sensing and environment. So today I will focus on presenting work that uh, was done, was has started within some of uh, the projects uh, that you see uh, that we have implemented the last uh, five years uh, with the uh, uh, money from the European Commission, with funding from the European Commission, that have started uh, as prototypes from uh, uh, resulting from these projects, but continued as uh, contracts with uh, industrial uh, partners. And uh, for this, uh, uh, for implementing this uh, projects, it's very important that we also as IPI participate in uh, important uh, European associations and clusters like uh, Big Data Value Association and uh, International Data Spaces Association. So uh, just a few words about uh, Industry 4.0. We all know about the three industrial revolutions. We are uh, now uh, implementing what is called as fourth industrial revolution, and especially in the manufacturing uh, area. Uh, until 2030, Europe is focusing on all these uh, domains. And the most important domain uh, regarding this uh, particular presentation is the adaptive and smart manufacturing systems with flexible and reconfigurable smart collaborative uh, robotics and also micro precision into pr production environment. Of course, as you can see, there are many other interesting uh, topics and uh, uh, research in uh, Europe has uh, to be targeted in uh, this uh, direction. Uh, as you can see, these are the, the main technologies behind what we call industry 4.0. And as, as you can see, artificial intelligence is one of the most important, but uh, important, but also other areas uh, that, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, are in the key uh, areas where uh, CERT is uh, working. Uh, and uh, apart from this, of course, uh, autonomous vehicles, drones, uh, and uh, digital twins are very, very important in terms of implementing this industry 4.0. Uh, revolution. Starting now, uh, uh, my uh, presentation on the use of uh, deep learning technologies on uh, uh, on, uh, on Industry 4.0. Uh, what deep learning can offer is to upgrade the AI capabilities in order to analyze high-dimensional 
data in real time. And I, I will go a little bit more detail that the idea is to be able to monitor hidden parameters in order to identify potential defects in the production lines to simulate and predict upcoming defects so that we can take some measures and don't do not actually stop the production and also to calibrate and dynamically configure some of the industrial processes so to be able automatically to uh, reduce the time that is needed for calibration of some of the industrial uh, processes and uh, this is the outline of my talk today I will focus on three areas, uh, deep learning for inspection, where uh, uh, I will present, I will present two use cases, fault diagnosis in a micro scale and improving sensor accuracy again in micro scale, both applied in uh, microelectronics. Uh, the second topic would be on deep learning for uh, prediction. Uh, one will be simulation, uh, prediction through simulation. And the second one will be generation of simulation data in order to feed the deep learning algorithms. In this particular case, we have two use cases on microelectronics and also fast block uh, calibration in elevator systems. And the third topic would be on deep learning for process calibration and self-optimization, uh, where we will have uh, two reinforced uh, learning uh, approaches on uh, production recalibration for the case of the elevator, and uh, optimizing the sensor acquisition uh, in terms of another uh, case, uh, which is the digital documentation. So I, very shortly, in five minutes, I would like, especially for the students, to say a few words about uh, the landscape of uh, deep learning. Here you can see some very, very typical and early stage uh, networks that have been used uh, in, uh, in various domains. I just like to mention that in 92, I did my diploma thesis in the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki on the use of backpropagation neural network, the fully connected uh, network, like the first one, in order to, to use it for uh, image compression, which was uh, a disaster. Uh, nothing uh, worked uh, due to the computational uh, capabilities of uh, the, uh, the, the PCs in this uh, in 92 when I did my diploma thesis, but also the memory uh, requirements that this project have. Uh, today we, we will uh, see some applications of the deep convolutional network, as we can see here, and also the deep residual network, but also uh, reinforcement learning uh, as, uh, as another uh, main area of uh, uh, of uh, deep learning methodology to, to, to be used. So I would like only to explain the convolutional neural networks, especially for the students to, to understand uh, how uh, this uh, revolution of artificial intelligence has begun. And uh, it started uh, mainly with uh, the, the significant success of convolutional uh, neural networks on image processing uh, tasks, image recognition and image processing uh, tasks. Uh, this is a shift of paradigm. In the past, we first computed the features with analytical techniques and then used some methodology to use these features to, 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 to take a decision. Now, feature estimation is an internal process of uh, this convolutional neural networks. And there are five phases, the building blocks. We have the convolutional layer, I will explain in a minute, the pooling layer, the fully connected layer, and the activation function. First of all, concerning the convolutional layer, imagine an, an image, and we are able to uh, convolve this image, actually to, to filter this with a set of uh, uh, different filters, and specifically this convolution kernel, and then sum the result and get the output. This is the output that you get from this particular operation. So this is what happens when we are running the convolutional layer. And of course, this is the opposite the transposed convolution. It is possible from uh, the two by two matrix to be able 
with the uh, upsampling uh, uh, filters, the transport convolution to be able to, to get uh, the three by three output. So this is the first layer of more of the CNNs that you will see in the future. Then we have a pooling layer. Uh, the idea here is to reduce dimensionality by either max pooling, which is taking the maximum of all these values. So you see the maximum of all these values 0 0.8, or average pooling. This is an example with the max pooling. And uh, batch normalization that you will see in many, many slides uh, in, uh, in this presentation is actually normalizing the results of each step so that you are able to, to convert uh, faster and uh, you are able uh, to accelerate the training, especially the procedure. Uh, and finally, at the end, you are able to run a fully collected layer. This is a typical fully connected layer, where uh, usually in these cases, you implement some kind of uh, uh, classification. You end up with some classes, for example, or some other uh, types, of, as, as you will see in the in, uh, next slide. And in this case, uh, what we are actually implementing is a, a function, which could be either the rectified linear unit, which is this function, which is actually linear if it is uh, positive, and zero for negative and the sigmoid function, which is actually uh, um, smoothing the results in the area between uh, uh, zero to, to one. It's, uh, so you can assign some kind of a probability score. Uh, so this is uh, the prior information that especially for students, uh, I wanted you to, to know so that you can partially understand some of the next uh, slides. Of course, <coughs> when we are talking about Deep learning, whenever we are talking about neural networks, in most of the cases, not all of the cases, in supervised neural networks, we have the process of training and the process of testing. So first we have to teach the, the network how to perform. And for this reason, this is the case that I have shown. You see the convolution kernels, the activation. Uh, this is the feature that you get. And especially for image process, these features have a physical meaning. And then you are able with back propagation to calculate a loss function and you try to, to, to you iterate until you minimize this uh, loss function. Uh, so this is uh, the, how, how you implement the training and then the network is trained and you just use it for testing. And as a result, this is a very, very fast procedure. So I start now with uh, the use cases. Uh, I start with the deep learning for inspection with a full diagnosis in micro scale for microelectronics. Uh, the outline is first uh, the use case description, how we get the data, uh, the methodology, and some uh, experimental results. So this is uh, this was implemented for company Microchip in the UK. It is about uh, being able to detect the dispensing of insufficient or excessive glue when you are creating printed circuit boards, the PCBs, uh, you actually first uh, dispense the glue and then you attach the integrated circuit. Uh, the, you know that if in a production line, there are cases like this where it is insufficient, the glue is insufficient, you like, or like this, where the glue is excessive, you just throw away the whole production line. So this is very, very important in order to reduce costs and to not stop the production line. So you need to be able to uh, identify that uh, you have uh, running uh, the production in a normal uh, situation with a normal amount of glue. So in order to understand the problem, the whole area is something like two to times 3.5 uh, square centimeters square. And we are interested in regions of only seven millimeters. So you see that this is a problem on a micro scale. That's why we use, I don't know if you can see here, this is a micro profilometer with accuracy either 20 micrometers or 50 micrometers. And this micro profilometer is a laser scanner and it's able to, to generate accurate 20 point clouds. So, in its module, as you can see here, there are 20 glue deposits. You see all of these are glue deposits, all of these rectangles of five different types. The types 
are the same B, C, D, and E. All types of glue are in these five classes. And we have in total 360 regions of interest per PCB. This is a PCB. So this is a description of what is the input. Then the microprotonometer is creating the 3D uh, point cloud, as you will see now. And uh, for each one of uh, these modules, we are able to detect all these areas of uh, glue. After the glue is dispensed, uh, we get something like this. We can see my mouse. And this is what happens after uh, uh, attaching the integrated circuits. You see what is actually captured by the microprotonometer. What is important is that in some cases, it is not very easy to understand where the in fact, sufficient or excessive uh, glue after the attachment of, uh, uh, of uh, the degraded cell. So this is uh, the output of uh, the microprotonometer in the five cases. And you can see the point cloud, the reconstruction, and this is after the attachment of the degraded cell. And uh, you can see some uh, surface mesh reconstruction, and then we are able to uh, estimate the volume. When we have the actual volume, then we can uh, uh, we know the volume and the type of uh, uh, glue, and then we are able to identify whether we are in any situation of uh, insufficient or excessive uh, glue dispensation. Dispensation. Uh, and here you see some cases where, where we have excessive or insufficient. You see clearly uh, glue. And these are the cases that are uh, uh, of interest uh, for us. Uh, now, this is, was an introduction to the problem, an introduction of the measuring procedure. And this is now the description of the database. Our database, at the end, is nothing else but an occupancy grid of this type. This voxelization of uh, the information that you get uh, from uh, experiments that uh, are actually in order to, to uh, in order to, pro to, to produce a, a, a significantly higher database for training we are using uh, we are simulating we're adding Gaussian noises only in the z axis and we are also shifting the bounding box on the, the x y plane in this way we are generating enough uh, data for training and now uh, our methodology that we call as a regression uh, network, it is a work of 2020 published on industrial, I believe that transaction industrial electronics. Uh, all these grids that you see here are of size 32 times 32 times 64. And we have five blocks of three dimensional convolutional uh, layers, layers. Then we have linear. Okay, activation reloop, the uh, rectified linear, linear unit, batch normalization, and uh, followed by the max pooling layer. And at the end, we have the flatten and dense uh, networks, which are nothing else but uh, uh, fully connected layers in order to be able to have a prediction for the uh, volume. So the input is this voxelized uh, 3D grid, the output is just one number, okay, just to understand how this works. Uh, in all cases, uh, the selection of five layers and the selection of uh, the tensor shape, the, the kernel size, all the parameters was done experimentally with grid cells. So we tested uh, repeatedly many different uh, approaches. This work uh, was supported by Project uh, Z Factor. And uh, as I mentioned, we used uh, L2 loss in order to estimate the uh, the, the difference of, of the output from the ground truth. And this is the case with the 20 millimeter uh, accuracy profilometer and the comparison of our method with other, with VoxNet, which is a, another uh, typical method and the, the ground truth. As you can see, I'm not sure if you can see, but it's clearly that uh, our net uh, is outperforming uh, the, the VoxNet. And you can see it also in terms of uh, 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 MSC for uh, for the 3D CNN. So this was the first work that we did with three-dimensional data in order to estimate uh, uh, the glue of the circuits. 
What is important is that uh, what I didn't show before, but there are, we have two cases. First is before the attachment of the degraded circuit, and then after the attachment of the degraded circuit. And as we can see, our method can perform sufficiently well in both cases. Uh, this is uh, uh, this was uh, the main contribution of this paper and uh, the provision of a solution uh, that uh, uh, can. Uh, uh, actually uh, run in a real industrial environment. Of course, there are limitations on this, and now I'm moving to the second uh, case for uh, inspection. Uh, you need to have a microperfilometer. You need to attach the microperfilometer. You need to take measurement for the microperfilometer. As, as I will explain, this is a timely procedure. So uh, we should find uh, uh, alternative approaches to do the same, and that's the reason why we thought about soft sensing. So, what is a soft sensor? Soft sensor is just a camera, of course, it's not. And this is the work that we did uh, for uh, in 2022 on uh, an IEEE transaction industrial informatics. So, it's not a webcam, it is a uh, this type of uh, camera with 24 megapixels, and you see the very high resolution. But it's very important that with such a camera, you can automatically uh, have a performance which, as you will see, could be uh, uh, could be similar to the one with the 3D profilometers. Uh, we created the data set keeping 75% for training and 25. 25% for uh, testing. However, we performed for this experiment also the 3D capture. You see, we keep this third row for testing and the other uh, two, three for uh, training. And uh, we are uh, actually using as ground truth the information that we get from the profilometer. Uh, what is uh, the, the idea is to have two different representations. Uh, to get the annotated samples from the 3D uh, microprofilometer, so to have the ground truth data, where ground truth is what is uh, uh, the actual, the reality, and then to see how far away is the estimation, the estimate, and calculate this estimation error. Uh, for the, the, there are various problems that have to be solved before actually running the. Uh, a similar approach like the one uh, presented in uh, the first part. Uh, first of all, you have to segment, you have to find this region that I mentioned before. Uh, that's why we have used uh, masks RCNN. It, it is uh, in the paper that is shown in the uh, end of this uh, slide, uh, where uh, we have uh, a multi objective uh, function with uh, classification loss uh, consisting of uh, cross entropy classification, this part. A bounding box regression loss and the mask segmentation loss term. So in this way, we can perform an initial segmentation of uh, of the areas, and we end up with an image like this. Then we introduce a 2D CNN. So the input now is an image, not a 3D uh, point cloud, that we call the residual network. You see, this architecture is residual, which means you are feeding this to the next layer also. Okay, and this is uh, a way to have uh, faster convergence, but also to to, to train it uh, on the error, on uh, also on the errors, and to we minimize at the end again the the L two uh, the L two uh, method. However, uh, this could be an approach that uh, could uh, save us from. All the work that is done with the capturing of the information of the microprofilometer. However, uh, this did not show to be able to produce the same results. And the reason is that we did then uh, one test that we put 20 millimeter measurements and 50 millimeter measurements, both with the microprofilometer. So this is, you know, can show it is here. So you see the significant difference but between the measurements of the three descent and then what we expect is that this error that you get with a 3D sensor 
would also occur with the occur with the uh, to the sensor. That's why we perform the same methodology in order to estimate the error. So we are actually running two, net, two networks, one for the estimation of the volume and the second for the estimation of the error. And this has shown to work relatively well. And this is this is actually summarizing the procedure. We get the RGB, RGB data, then we segment it. Uh, we get uh, the region of interest, segmenting the module, detecting the glue, and running the regression uh, network. And as we can see, there is no requirement on the uh, orientation of uh, the PCB. And uh, also, you can see the after uh, the, the faster CRN, the RCNN, the other network that we used for the estimation of the bounding boxes, that we have very accurate uh, results. Uh, in terms of uh, glue detection. So then uh, you can see the results that we get with a uh, different size of the depth of the network. So with 10, uh, layer, 10, 10 layers, 18 layers, and 34 later layers, we did many tests. And we can see now here with the uh, bolt where we get the best uh, results. And in most of the cases, 10 layers could be enough in, uh, for the first three types. And uh, then for uh, Training, uh, introducing also the estimation of the error, you can see that we can get much better uh, results in all the cases. So it's clear that uh, also compared to other methods like DenseNet, MobileNet, and uh, v, uh, VGG, that uh, we are able to have a method for, for most of the types that works uh, significantly better than other uh, methods uh, uh, in the literature. So, in this way, we end up, this is very important, with inspection that takes less than one minute, while on the, in the inspection times uh, with the use of the profilometer, uh, only the scanning and not running the network takes more than 20, 30 minutes. So we are able to reduce 20, 30 times the total time of uh, this procedure. Okay. Uh, next step for us is to introduce this to an augmented reality glasses, uh, where we will use the camera of the glasses. This is really a challenge, and we are currently working uh, on that, so that there is uh, the operator with uh, augmented reality glasses and is able on the fly to see what, uh, what is happening in terms of uh, uh, in a, in sufficient or excessive uh, glue. Now, uh, moving to the next uh, uh, topic, which is uh, prediction, uh, in the similar, very, very similar use case, the idea here is to see what happens uh, if uh, in time, because uh, in the needle, in the spacing needle, uh, when uh, operating in many, 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 many times, you get the bris that is accumulated in the dispensing uh, needle. And this, as a, as a result, uh, the reduction of the actual glue that is dispensed. Uh, for this, we are actually using triplets in order to estimate what happens on the fourth uh, on the fourth uh, 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 the fourth uh, uh, picture that we that we uh, get. That's not actually a, pic a picture; it's a, a point cloud. Again, now we are moving. In the method with the micro profilometer, we have seen already this part, and the, we are getting the occupancy grid. And now, uh, and we are getting into a little bit more complicated, uh, but still uh, CNNs and uh, uh, methods where we uh, we have uh, knee plus one and n plus one time steps uh, and n plus one actual. Uh, networks, uh, regression networks, as I presented before. And then we have the transpose. And then we have a new method for the calculation of the loss. This is part again of the Z factor and the paper on uh, 2020 on uh, simulation modeling practice and uh, theory. Uh, this is also explained the transpose convolutional block. Again, the number of uh, layers were selected uh, experimentally. And what is uh, important here is this part where we are actually introducing 
a new metric, not the L2, but we are also uh, getting the, the cross entropy measure. And this is actually estimated through uh, using another 3D CNN for classification. <laughs> and uh, how is this operating is a typical R net again, which is followed by a, a sigmoid, fully con two fully connected layers and the sigmoid. And the end, uh, at the end, this at this end, this network is trained to produce nine classes, which is very low, depending from the very low to the very high uh, amount of uh, glue quantity. And this is uh, how we actually train this network to minimize the cross entropy uh, loss. So, uh, concerning the experimental results, you can see these are the four uh, frames. Uh, that uh, we get uh, for different glue types, A, A B, C, and uh, D, and E. Uh, this is the ground truth. So this is the reality here. Yep, sorry. sorry, it's not easy from here to, to show. And this is the estimation uh, using the L, L2 measure and uh, the, then with uh, the combined uh, measure. And in terms of the actual measurements on the glue, uh, it is uh, really, uh, much better, uh, the, res the results are much better, and as you can see, significantly increases metrics like the F score and, uh, uh, and the precision uh, recall uh, curve. Uh, okay, so uh, the, uh, the interesting uh, part is that we are able now to predict what will happen in time using previous information. Uh, using a rather complex combination of uh, CNN models. Uh, in terms of uh, prediction, you will allow me to drink some water because I have many meetings <laughs> from 9.30. Okay, so now uh, this, uh, this uh, part uh, is actually uh, refers to the creating creation of simulation data in order to be able to train the networks. This is also very important because it takes a lot of time to capture uh, information. So it is in general, I will present this generative uh, modeling and uh, some a new use case, the elevator use case that you will see and also the PCB use case. So the idea is to, to use some models to be able to generate synthetic data uh, in order as I said, to to, to produce uh, a large uh, a larger database to train uh, the models, uh, and this is possible because of the constrained nature of the industrial data. So it is not uh, a real world picture that you have no clue of what is shown, but it is a, uh, it is really constrained, and you are able to be able to generate, as you will see, uh, generate data in uh, this respect. Now this is the elevator control use case. I don't want you. I don't want to make you experts on elevators. I'm not an expert person, but the company Clement at, uh, uh, in uh, North Greece is working on that. And the most important part before uh, delivering an elevator is to be able to control these weights, the way that the elevator is moving in the Z direction from the top floor to to the uh, ground floor. And uh, this is uh, done with uh, what this control valves and it's manually done until today. And this is the main reason of delay when you order an elevator. And what our work with Clema was to automate this uh, procedure to be able to automatically, uh, to automatically uh, uh, perform this uh, estimation of the parameters of this control valves. So just to, to give you some information, the, what we want is to get this input. This is the displacement on the z, z axis. Okay, it's just displacement, it's a movement. To get this input and to end up with the parameters that will be used to, to for uh, uh, controlling the valves that are actually uh, uh, that actually control again the movement of uh, the weights. So uh, in this case, just this is. What we get as input, uh, in this case, input is just uh, uh, a video of uh, this procedure uh, in the testing environment. You can see 
what types of uh, video we can get, and we are generating a, a video. And the only thing that we are performing at the, at the beginning is this segmentation where we are getting uh, the frames that have the actual information. So we are moving because you see this is done in a completely industrial environment. That's all. The problem here is to be able to generate this type of videos, this type of frames using as information only the displacement. Okay, so we have to design this decoder to get as input what we call ZI, which is nothing else but this, the displacement, and to get as output uh, the frames. For this, uh, we have uh, constructed a network of five uh, residual assembly blocks. As you can see, again, uh, a residual network and uh, with uh, upsampling uh, blocks. And uh, uh, of course, selected again experimentally in order to get the dimension of the desired uh, resolution and to minimize again the L1 loss function. The same case holds for the glues that now you are experts, you have heard a lot about the glues. Uh, and uh, the attachment of the graded circuits on PCBs. So the idea is to give a number, this is the volume, and to be able to create uh, the RGB image that uh, corresponds to this uh, uh, volume. Uh, and again, we are using the same assembly block with the same uh, uh, reconstruction loss uh, function. Uh, as a result, and this is interesting to see, I will run the three videos, it's three different cases, as you see, it accelerates at the beginning, the other accelerates at the end. As you can see, it is very, very interesting. You see the, the reduction of accuracy in this area. Again, in this area, you will have significant reduction of accuracy on the images produced, on the video produced. However, it has shown that this information could be used for uh, training the models that we have seen before. This is very, very important because otherwise we need to actually perform all this uh, different tests in order to create this uh, database. And the same for, uh, for the glue. As you can see, the accuracy is not very high. However, uh, it has shown that uh, we can use this data to train uh, our models. Uh, so this is uh, uh, future work on that is uh, to, to use as much as possible such types of data as you can see also on the end. And to evaluate also in other uh, industrial cases because it has shown to work uh, specifically well. And now I'm moving to the last uh, two cases on uh, uh, deep learning for process calibration and self optimization. Uh, this is again the case of the elevator, but in, uh, in this case, we want to be able to have a system, an agent that automatically calibrates the valves that you have seen before. Of course, uh, the scarcity of the data that we have, because it's not a typical example that you can get uh, large amounts of uh, data and the limited exploration that we can perform, uh, uh, show us that the reforms of learning could be a relevant method that could be used. And uh, we are evaluating in the elevator uh, case. Uh, for uh, reinforcement learning, the idea is that the environment, we are observing the environment, and we have the environment at a specific state, and moving to another state gets a reward. It could be a positive, a negative, or no reward. And this is fed into the agent, which then takes action and updates the parameters in order uh, to, uh, to uh, respond to this uh, reward. Uh, uh, for the elevator use case, again, you see we have the displacement as input. We have the reinforcement learning agent. You see these uh, tools that are actually programming the parameters of uh, the valve. And this is the result that you can get uh, at the end with the optimal uh, calibration. Of course, this is a procedure that would save significant time for Klima in a real industrial uh, case. Uh, hardware setup. So to do this, uh, we are actually uh, having a, a Jetson to perform all the computations and uh, just an Arduino uh, to be able to control the motors that are actually controlling the valves. 
So we have done this setup with uh, the motors that you can see here that control the valves and of course the, uh, the Arduino board that uh, controls the motor controllers uh, uh, for the valve. This is uh, the setup. Again, we are using a similar procedure as uh, you have seen before uh, to get the dynamic behavior of the system because this is the most important here to get the actually five consecutive frames uh, in each case. And we use five downsampling uh, blocks to get the representation uh, uh, feature. And this, uh, of course, is trained until the, it is actually min minimizing the mu square error. And uh, of course, we have to find that this is very easy to find a way to start this procedure only when the motion starts. And this is done with some simple thresholding in our case. And then we are performing what we call the reinforcement learning and uh, I will, this is the idea that the agent is uh, producing an action the action is done on the for, I, for our case is uh, uh, estimating some parameters these are fed into the valves and then we are estimating the quality that we get and then we have a reward positive or negative and we have also the new state and this is fed to, to the agent uh, for implementing this, we have used a deep uh, Q learning approach, uh, approach where the action uh, uh, value function is implemented as, uh, uh, as uh, this uh, parameter Q uh, in the implementation of a deep Q learning network. I think uh, it's not uh, very, uh, I think all the details uh, uh, are not very important here. What is important is to, to see that this Q parameter can actually be estimated with a soft sensing uh, module by using the same uh, feature extractor uh, for the this fun Q function approximation. So uh, for, for this, in order to initialize the procedure, we use the synthetic data that we produced uh, before, and we are training the encoder on the data to predict the action uh, that, that is taken for the current and the future states by minimizing the cross energy, uh, cross entropy load that you see in uh, this uh, parameter. And then, uh, so this whole procedure, whole procedure is the offline Q learning to initialize the uh, reinforcement learning parameters. And then the decoder and encoder models uh, are actually used to generate synthetic transitions, which are used to initialize. The, the weights of the RLA. So this is a rather complicated procedure. However, it is needed so that you, the, the procedure uh, starts with the right uh, initialization. For the, uh, for the case that we are examining and the soft sensing, so the camera, right, okay, uh, the capturing of the motion of the weights with the camera, we're estimating the displacement and the velocity of uh, the weights. So this is the velocity here, and this is the displacement. And uh, uh, we, we estimate during the movement. So there is no actual training procedure. So it estimates uh, the new position on the fly. And uh, uh, in its, uh, the average reward, reward for per episode, and uh, for in our case, we used uh, nine episodes which episodes for us is the controlled movements of the weights. So for nine cases, we are just moving the weights with various parameters, and we're uh, using it to initialize the system. You see various episodes that we have used uh, for this. And then the, learn the agent learns how to calibrate the, the valve block within a small number of uh, trials. And uh, this is uh, very important uh, for us. It's uh, rather... Uh, a uh, complicated procedure, but it gives a solution to a very important problem and it can be used also to other industrial cases. And uh, we could also advance the, uh, advance the reinforcement learning algorithms to achieve even faster uh, calibration and to be able to train, uh, to initialize uh, better on um, some very challenging uh, states for the level. And uh, uh, the last uh, presentation for today, I hope I didn't uh, <laughs> give you 
<laughs> much information, and then I hope I still have time. I will try in five minutes to five seven minutes to finish. So in this case, uh, this is a rather interesting uh, case, uh, different than uh, uh, the, the previous ones. Uh, this is a case where we are. Maybe I will start from this. This is a setup that we have uh, with a German uh, company called Tutronic that is actually implementing this for a demo. Uh, the idea is to have a setup with uh, uh, in which setup you have uh, a camera. You see here, I don't see it, but you see it. And uh, then you have two luminaires. Uh, led luminous and uh, of course a car that is uh, passing through uh, the camera the idea here and the problem the actual problem is to be able in any uh, lighting uh, conditions so in, if another car comes with a light shopper if something changes in the illumination to be able to automatically calibrate to the best illumination strategies okay sorry this one okay so uh, this uh, shows an example of how uh, reflections are very very important in order to be able to solve some problems this this is part of uh, an, a method that we have created to estimate scratches in cars and this is uh, uh, actually as a result of this work we have a new uh, spin-off at uh, CERT called Automavis which is actually implementing all uh, this uh, context. It's very, very important. It can be used by a company, uh, car renting companies you know, in the delivery of the cars. And it is used in, uh, we have, uh, there are talks with uh, uh, um, operators that use uh, fleets of cars that every day uh, perform deliveries and come back to, to the office. It is an automatic procedure that can find very, very uh, 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 detailed scratches. And for this, the most important part is the illumination. So here I'm showing only the first part, which is the automatic illumination uh, control. And uh, uh, as we see, this is the setup, and this is what we get, uh, the two illumination uh, units on uh, the vehicle. In this case, uh, we use, uh, again, uh, uh, Deep uh, reinforcement uh, learning with the DQN agent as we have seen before. In our case, this is a, a convolutional neural network, as you can see uh, here. But uh, at uh, uh, the actions that we have is either increase or decrease the illumination or no action. Uh, so this agent is actually implemented through this CNN. Then it illuminates. This is the actual environment. We are estimating the image quality. This is a work on nitrogen axis. Uh, we are estimating the image quality, uh, taking into account two parameters, the image entropy plus uh, the uh, plus uh, the LW component, which is a component which introduces also feedback from the users. So the users have seen uh, the actual images and produced this Gaussian function, and we have used this Gaussian function in order, uh, probability density function in order to reduce uh, the area in order to, to not allow saturation of uh, the image. So it's, as a result, then uh, this combined uh, metric could be either positive or zero. Uh, in terms, if it is positive, then uh, the reward function is one, if it is negative, the reward function is zero. So this is how we actually implemented, sorry, this reward function that you see here. Okay, it is interesting to see some experimental results. So this is uh, the target illumination zone, also defined by the users. Uh, the area where we, we need our illumination to be almost constant. And uh, we are running 2,000 uh, steps, and we are introducing manually some other illumination change, so important illumination change. We are introduced to see how the network will uh, react. And uh, as you see, it immediately converges. You see this are the abstract case, and immediately converges to the area that we are targeting. And this is the result, and you see this is the reward function 
plus one, plus uh, minus one, minus one, plus one. And you see after, uh, I don't know how many, 10, uh, it's something like 10, 10, 10 uh, iterations, it converges and it's able again to have the optimal uh, illumination for the case that we are uh, examining. Uh, this is uh, uh, the main innovation point is that even if we have abrupt, uh, abrupt uh, illumination changes, uh, it is able again to converge on the desired uh, uh, layer, uh, layer. This is very important. This is a, we are talking about an automatic system for delivering uh, uh, cars. Uh, and and so this is, uh, it is very important that you are able to use it any time of uh, the day and in any type of environment. That's why this is the first part of our work. I will not present the, the scratch patterns with the, our accuracy as around 70%, but it's considered very, very high. It is a very difficult uh, problem because of dirt, because of uh, other cases that may, may appear. And uh, so, so it shows that we can have uh, systems that can on the fly uh, calibrate uh, in uh, the desired uh, uh, position. So some uh, research challenges uh, for us. Uh, we are uh, uh, general. We want to reduce uh, the time to come to to collect uh, uh, this uh, defective uh, sample. So it is very important to work a little bit more on the synthetic data generation in the domains that we are working, and also be able to use some domain adaptation methods to to get to introduce some knowledge into the, the solution. Uh, what is more important is an area that we have started the last uh, uh, year is to include in the zero defect manufacturing solution, the solutions like uh, human in the loop, uh, active learning, uh, active learning and training schemes, uh, where uh, you get a CNN for the detection of the defects, then you visualize the result to the user, you get feedback from the user, then you re retrain the model and use some different types of uh, loss functions. In our case, we plan to use focal loss that is uh, actually uh, putting more attention on the very hard sums, on the, the, the largest uh, problems that your estimate uh, has. These are uh, research directions for the future. This is uh, the group uh, that has worked on this. Mainly this is work from Nikos Dimitriou, uh, Apostolos Evangelides, and uh, Labrus Leudaris and colleagues have worked in some of uh, the use cases. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, thank you for the exciting talk and the very nice industrial application. Um, we have time for questions, so. Um, yes, please. Thank you, Dimitri, for the presentation. It's very nice to see all these industrial applications of learning. And on the left half, you mentioned that you try to identify the best model using research. Yes. Can you give us an idea of how many models? Uh, there, there are uh, details are in the. Ah, yes, please. And the second is, can you give us an idea on the type of infrastructure that you use to train the model? Yes. Uh, I, we use a Jetson, but in most of the cases, it's just a Jetson. For the training part? Uh, for the training part, yes. For the training part, we uh, sorry, I didn't understand the question. For the training part, we use the nodes that we have uh, uh, at CERT. We have uh, some cloud nodes that we are using a number of uh, 16 now nodes where we are actually training all the members. For the first part, all the details are in the papers and uh, uh, in most of the cases, that I've, we have done many, many experiments. So it is a uh, grid search is an operation that has taken uh, a lot of uh, uh, working around with the parameters. Uh, but the de details are in the papers now. I don't know exactly, but I know that we could have done a large number of experiments in order to end up with a number of layers and a number of parameters. Okay. Questions? 
Everyone understood everything or no one understood? Yeah. Yes. Uh, just a moment. You mean uh, for the for the reason? Yes, yes. This case, yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, is this a case? Ah, generating the case. Okay. Uh, so you how how we generate? We uh, when you have um, in the in the database when this is when you are creating the database for training. This is the input and the output is the cam the uh, video that is captured by the camera. Okay, so you are you have. Uh, as a as training database, the displacement, which is this curve, and the video that corresponds to this displacement. So you get, you do many, many experiments, and you end up with a large list of videos and the, uh, the, and the velocity. And then you train uh, this upsampling network in order to be able at the end to minimize this loss. So you, these are upsampling. Uh, so you are absorbing this information in order to be able to to minimize uh, uh, this. Uh, in this way, at the end, you have the video that you have created and the one that is generated by the network. And iteratively, this converges to something that is really close to what you have seen at the beginning. As I said, these problems that we have uh, yes, are very uh, specific, and uh, the difference between the videos produced uh, is uh, is not uh, 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 is not as a difference that you would expect from a real world uh, picture, and and in this way you are able to to generate data of uh, high accuracy. But again, you see that the, there are uh, it is not one hundred percent accurate. Uh, on the other hand, the information which is the the movement. Is actually captured in the video, and you can use them for training. I hope I answered your question. Other questions? <laughs> so I have a microphone, and my voice is to be loud. Can you hear me? It was a very common talk. My question is a little bit higher in the sense that uh, this type of application that you have uh, showed us. Uh, Rely on very specific data. For example, which application has its own data, let's say restrictions in terms of what, what the features are classified and what features it can provide. From your expertise with all these uh, variable scenarios, how much retraining do you think is feasible going from one model to another when you switch applications? Is it starting from, like, say, ground zero, or is there some feature that you can transfer between? Uh, each application. I think uh, in similar uh, problems, for example, the glue case, uh, I, it doesn't, it will not require significant retraining. It is a defect. You can train with similar defects, maybe with the same type of message, same layers, maybe small modifications. In, in the elevator case, is a very specific experiment. Yeah, that's, in that's this case, I think it, uh, it could be something like starting from zero. In the last case, uh, I would say that, uh, of course, there's no actual training. There's just some initialization. I think that initialization uh, uh, would, would use similar methods in the last case. So only in the second case, I would say that uh, maybe you can start from almost zero. But you can use the methodology, of course. You can rely on this methodology. Okay. Is there any insight on the type of network, for example, or the type of... Uh... Uh, features that you can transfer, or it's still same thing. I, I think the 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 type of networks uh, here are basically two types: the the CNNs and the residual ones. So I think th you can start from uh, from the, this type of methodology. You can have five layers. You can have three layers. You can have more layers. You can introduce some other uh, classification part uh, in uh, one case it depends on the problem so it's very general for me to think now but i i believe that uh, if you have similar 
case, for example, what is similar to the movement of weights of an elevator? I'm not sure I'm ready to answer, but in some uh, uh, industrial cases, there may be some similarities and you can use a similar approach. <laughs> Any, any final question? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. So, I also know a question since the project we are uh, in collaboration with companies. So, how easy uh, is it to convince them to get uh, annotated data? Um, uh, or more some more practical aspects. Uh, the you mentioned uh, you want to go into adaptation and active learning. So uh, in, in a way, it's like to continually receive annotated data with them. So what are the practical? Uh, how we do they are or how the they are for current mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Uh, starting was this because it started uh, in a European project as a prototype. So it was part of their work in the project, so they did. So st starting was this. Then when they saw uh, the amount of time that uh, they can uh, get, they can get as a reduction. Uh, then uh, specifically for Clema, Clema is now in some kind of uh, is a very big format. First of all, is uh, international, is world, working worldwide, and uh, is actually now focusing on innovation. In order to, to be able to, to cope with the competition. And uh, they want to introduce innovative uh, aspects and to reduce the time of delivery. Uh, so, uh, specifically for Clement, uh, especially for the elevator case, uh, they came to us after the end of the project and said, Is it possible to, to take it to the end? Uh, and uh, with, together with them now, uh, not in the project, we are working on this uh, active learning uh, concept. Because uh, always the expertise of some uh, people that are working uh, uh, for, for uh, uh, decades in uh, this uh, particular job can be introduced in such a system. So, in the presentation, as a student of the University of Cyprus, that's interesting from the architectural department. And I have a question regarding some implications of uh, the case technologies. For example, in the kind of technology architecture, I can mention a lot of applications, and especially in the communication part from the digital community. So, my main question is as a data science specialist, doctor, uh, what do you believe is a um, good way for us? I think uh, architecture uh, is uh, could be one very, very interesting uh, use case. We have 3D data, very detailed. Uh, you have the planning uh, data. You have some, in case of renovation, you may have the actual data plus some modifications you want to introduce. It is a typical case that such, such networks would work. That's my first. Uh, uh, and and uh, it, is, uh, it should be a case where uh, easily you can train uh, uh, you can train a system to learn uh, your uh, approach for a specific uh, uh, type of uh, building. For example. Uh, my name is uh, Nikita, I'm from uh, European University in uh, Cyprus. And uh, uh, in regard to this question, I, I was involved in uh, the project actually. Uh, it was uh, a product for a uh, furniture factory. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, obviously, they had few models of furniture, but a lot of uh, the materials they use uh, to, for the furniture. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, there was a generative model trained for them. Uh, which uh, could show uh, potential buyers how 
this particular software we will work with, uh, with this uh, type of or, or this type of yeah. so probably we will achieve something similar could be if you have very accurate data in architecture, that way, if so you have very accurate data, you can create uh, as large data sets as uh, you want to train any type. I, I said you have accurate data. I would say problem if you need to observe uh, renovation. This is more difficult. Yes, but planning, I would say the, you should be able to. Train. My question. Uh, yes. I mean, I mean, you know, it's uh, confused that uh, for integration of elevators, uh, they are relying on videos. Why not to place just a cheap accelerometer on the top of the elevator and use it as a loop? Uh, it could be the case. It could be the case, uh, but. Uh, uh, for the, the, uh, I, I said it in my maybe I didn't say, but it's written in the presentation. It is very important. For, there will always be uh, an operator, and it's very important for the operator to have a visual representation of the movement because this movement. So sorry, I go back. Yes, this movement here that it's the displacement and the velocity. It is designed, but there uh, it has to be tested. So they want to see how it works. So if you, you have seen, sometimes it accelerates at the beginning, it slows down. Uh, so for this reason, this is uh, also very important for them to have the visualization. Uh, then uh, apart from this, I think that is uh, with the video, it's very, very accurate. It could be with another solution. Could be. But this is the reason for this particular problem. They want also to have a visualization of all the tests that uh, they are performing and the whole the, uh, the whole procedure, because this is a this is a revolution for Clema. This is a revolution because this is the biggest problem they have to to come and create your elevator. Each elevator is different. This is something you don't know. I didn't know. Okay. Uh, I, I would like to. Yeah, so let's uh, thank the speaker once again for the opportunity.